Hi, y'all. It's Bridget Cutshaw with Real Things Living. Today, my guest is William Ferriolo. He is a philosophy professor and he is an author of many books. I lost count. Can you um, introduce yourself, William? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm William Ferriolo. People know me, call me Bill. My wife and my mom call me Billy. But uh, Oh, okay. I'm going to call you Bill then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you call me Bill. That's fine. Thanks. And uh, yeah, I've written uh, six books. Um, five have, have been published. One is on the way to coming out next uh, year. And I'm working on, uh, actually, I've just recently finished number seven, uh, but it hasn't sort of entered the pipeline yet. Uh, so. That's awesome. I think you're, you're very inspiring on, on what you're doing. And just so people know that um, you're, you specialize, well, you write a lot about stoicism and how that applies to our, our life. What got you interested in f philosophy and stoicism? I'm just curious. Well, it's a long story. I'll give you the short version. Uh, <laughs> I, I became a philosopher because I blew out my knee on my 18th birthday. Oh. Uh, I had an ROTC scholarship to go to college. I was going to go into the military, the army. But uh, when I blew out my knee, I lost the scholarship and I lost my uh, career plans. So I had to figure out something else to do. I was taking some philosophy courses and uh, I thought I had an aptitude for it. I enjoyed it. So I went to grad school and after a while, you know, somebody shoves a PhD in your face and says, go get a job. So I <laughs> didn't, know to, didn't know how to do that, but I stumbled around and I finally found a job. I, I teach at uh, San Joaquin Delta College in Stockton. I live up the road in Lodi, California. Um, are you a CCR fan at all? I'm not sure what CCR means. Green Clear Water Revival, they're a band. Oh, yes. Okay, yes. I know who they are. Yes, yes. You no, know that's not. Oh, Lord, stuck in a low diet. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> my um, and I got uh, interested in stoicism kind of by accident. I, uh, I have a, something of an anxiety and depression disorder that I uh, inherited from my dad, apparently. Um, and, uh, you know, it was kind of ruining my life in my 30s. And uh, I stumbled upon Epictetus. The discourses of Epictetus, and after I read a bit of it, I, I knew this had to be part of the program of, uh, of managing my, you know, my emotions, my psychological states, and developing a, a more resilient uh, character. Hope that wasn't I, too long. I like that story because it to me, as um, someone else I had talked to, they talked about how you can heal yourself by contributing to others, and it kind of sounds like what you're doing, um, being a professor and helping the students, maybe. Well, I hope so. Yeah, it helped with the uh, understanding of the concept of stoicism. And the book that I, I read you um, earlier this year is called A Life Worth Living. And that the title just pulled me in. And I think it was published in January this year. And it's really, it's about, from my understanding, helps you learn how to develop some self-control and, and to over, overcome like certain kind of bad behavior. Is that right? Yes, that's uh, it, it's actually a collection of academic articles that I've published over the past 20 years. Right. But uh, most of the book is about stoicism and stoic practice and uh, developing greater self-discipline, developing greater wisdom. There are, however, some uh, other topics. I, I do address um, questions about the existence of God, arguments for and against. I address uh, the concept of the multiverse uh, as a counterweight to the you know appearance of design in our anthropic universe and i even do a, a brief uh, film review of no country for old men <laughs> it's all it's all uh, related to uh, approach through a kind of a, a prism of um, of stoicism and wanting to be able to uh, govern oneself more uh, in a more rational fashion correct rather than reacting right <laughs> It's, I mean, that's what I've seen a lot of. And, and this book came out um, before our COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. and it very, I think it's applicable. Um, I certainly hope so. Yeah, I, I, I really think it is. And I think this is a time to reflect um, and not, you know, moan and groan. I don't know. It's everybody's situation is different. And I was very fortunate that I've always over 20 years worked out of my house. So it didn't affect me really in that mm -hmm. regard, having a, and my kids are adults. So mm -hmm. that helps. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've, I've been in a kind of a similar circumstance. I've, I had been driving to work in Stockton, but now I'm teaching online due to COVID and it hasn't been, it's, it's been a bit of an adjustment, but nothing like I think what, what most people uh, are going through. But you are correct that no matter what hits us, whether it's a pandemic or a death in the family or 
uh, loss of a job or something like that. Moaning and groaning is not a great strategy for dealing with uh, any challenges. <laughs> it's right. always better off trying to reason your way through to uh, right. you know, a, a better condition. And, and, and in getting some support, the right support, some shape or form, sure. I think it's, it's, it's helpful. And, and to not, to, I also think to not do everything by yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it depends upon, depends upon what the challenge is. Right. It depends on what it is. And just like with um, parents with younger kids right now who are dealing with all this, they are, um, I'm so glad my kids are adults now. I, you know, I, I want to handle it fine, I guess, because I'm used to working at home. <laughs> And, and I used to have to travel, but that's not happening right now. <laughs> so right. It's uh, if my husband um, traveled a lot for work and he hasn't had to travel since February. And it's just because of the, the client's um, definition of what's happening in the business. And, and like you said, it's difficult probably teaching online. Is it mostly like on video calls, Zoom calls or? Uh, there, there are some Zoom videos. Uh, I've tried to avoid the Zoom conferences because from what I understand, if too many professors and too many students are doing that simultaneously, uh, the system is apt to crash. That's, that's a good point. My sister is a seventh grade teacher. And when this all happened here in Georgia in March, their system was crashing constantly right. um, in the beginning because they weren't used to having so many people online and I think Zoom had to do a lot of stuff too because there were some security issues. Yes, there's a new phenomenon called Zoom bombing, which uh, <laughs> afflicted some of my colleagues. What, so I've done instead of, I, I've just uploaded a bunch of pre-recorded videos and uh, my awesome. PowerPoints and you know, links to readings and stuff like that. So um, I think it's going well, all things considered, but it's not exactly the ideal pedagogical environment. Um, but hey, we. No one promised us an ideal environment, right? No, yeah. and yeah. I think, right, and that's what life is about. You got to learn. It's going to be changed constantly. There's mm -hmm. always a change going on. You have to learn some shape or form to adapt. Absolutely. And I think that's really where, to me, <clears throat> based on, I don't, I'm not as, you know, good on you and stoicism. I think that's kind of where it fits in. And and it's just to, to self-control in a way. <laughs> it's that, That's one of the four cardinal virtues of oh. stoicism. Wisdom, what is courage, for? Yeah. But, uh, wisdom, courage, justice, and self-discipline, self-control, or temperance can be translated in a variety of different ways. Um, the ideal is to develop those four cardinal virtues, those states of character, and to eventually attain eudaimonia. It's a fancy, you know, um, pretentious Greek term, which just means flourishing, living well, living a virtuous life, a life worth living. I like that, A Life Worth Living, which is the book that I like. And then I just remember the other book that I read of yours. It's called Meditations on, on Self-Discipline. Yeah, Meditations um, on Self-Discipline and Failure. That was uh, that one came out three years ago, I think. Right, and I think that's probably how I, I first learned about you. Um, or maybe someone recommended, um, Scott Perry, I think, recommended you to me. I don't know if you remember or know Scott. Um, yeah, uh, he interviewed me uh, when the first book came out. I think that's what how I learned about you. Yeah, he and I um, did um, this thing called Alt MBA together for Seth Good. <laughs> yeah, Scott's, and, a, Scott's a cool dude. I like what he's doing. Yeah, and I did it. Um, I was in the uh, Scott came after I did. I did like the first group. I like to take risks sometimes. You know, I'm one of the beta groups, and good and bad, right? But I learned that um, my big takeaway and being in that kind of group was how we learn so much by working together from different perspectives. Sure. Um, if that makes sense. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, uh, everyone knows something that I don't know and that you don't know. Everybody has expertise in, in fields other than ours. Um, we can learn from anyone. Uh, we can learn from anyone, anything, any condition, any circumstance, if we're just attentive. Um, there's always like something to be gleaned. I like that word attentive. It, it's true. And being, being focused, being in the moment. Right. And right. sometimes I do have it in the past, a tendency to like, you know, the shiny squirrel thing. So being focused, <laughs> well, everybody has that. I'm sure. Yeah. We all, we all uh, lose our, our, our attention once in a while. We all, <laughs> we're, we're all a little ADD, right? <laughs> right. And I, I was, you mentioned that. And I think that's kind of what's so unique now. I probably would have been diagnosed with ADD if I was a kid 
these days. Probably, I probably would have also. I'm, you know, I'm almost 52 and they didn't really have the ADD diagnosis when I was a kid, but I, I'm pretty sure I would have qualified. Right. And I just had a thing about um, not, I challenged authority. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I did. I guess because I'm a military brat. You know, okay. I mean, like my father was in the military. My mom was married a couple of times. And so you, your environment is different all the time. Sure. So well, I, I wasn't afraid to question things. I, I, I think there's a, I think a lot of us have that tendency. We, a lot of us really don't like being told what to do. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. But it's important to learn when when to heed good advice and good counsel and, and when to strike out on your own. Yeah, just don't do it to a six-year-old. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I was, and I think it, a lot had to do with, um, that was around the time my parents got divorced, you know, and I probably was just mad anyway, you know, and then we all just take it a certain way. And that's probably why I had an older brother. So I wanted to be like him. You know, I think that's kind of, I think we're very, in tune to you know our surroundings and and copy that is that the right word sure we're all to some degree at least we're all a function of heredity and environment broadly construed you know there's our dna and there's what happens to us from uh, from when we're in the womb to when we come out and all you know and continuing of course as we have experiences and learn things and, um, yeah product of our environment to some extent right and, and i also when i look back on that i think that actually helped me be more more resilient as an adult. Um, dealing with those tough issues made me more uh, empathetic, maybe, um, sure. to a degree. And yeah, uh, I think one of the great dangers is uh, making life too easy, too soft, too gentle, so that when, you know, a, a person who really never faces any adversity, never uh, has to deal with any kind of deprivation, when a moment like this hits, when you know the COVID moment hits, or when something happens that's potentially frustrating, uh, or potentially potentially leads to anger and other negative emotional states, if you've never dealt with adversity, you don't really have the cognitive wherewithal and the emotional wherewithal to uh, respond in a rational fashion. So, I, uh, I sometimes worry that we're we're producing a generation uh, that's a little too emotionally soft. A little too, you know, you've heard of Generation Snowflake, right? Yes, I've heard of that. <laughs> and I know some people object to the term, but it didn't come from nowhere. <laughs> there, there is some reason for it. I, I agree with that. There, it's a lot of, um, I mean, that's, that's why I think it's wrong to diagnose kids with ADD, you know what I'm saying, or, or put them on these drugs. Um, that's just my opinion. It, it can affect yeah. their brains when they're young. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't know enough about neurochemistry to take a position on it, but uh, I, I do wonder if it's not at the very least being overdiagnosed and if those yes. drugs are not being over. And labeling, we're labeling. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I, I think it, it is, there is at least a danger in telling a child from a young age you have this defect, you have this cognitive dysfunction. Um, now, in some cases, it may be true, but we we ought to be careful about you know. Right. Having, it's like their confidence, I think. And just like, uh, I have an example. I want to share a personal experience with my brother-in-law. I was sharing too much. His, uh, he actually has a, um, my husband's older brother, he has an issue, right? And his parents were kind of in denial and they expected him to take care of himself. And when he lived with us for about a year, I'm like, oh, I knew something wasn't, being around him 20, you know, a lot, I knew something wasn't right. So I got him, uh, he kept getting fired and things like that. And he just didn't, it turns out he has a um, uh, poor contact with reality. He's not autism or anything, but it's just a, it's a um, mental thing. <laughs> and so I got him to where the stake um, so that he they can't be fired anymore because he does have an issue. Medication is not going to help him, right? And, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know his condition. Well, that's what they're that's what they were saying, and so I don't know specifically um, what they. It, it's sort of a form of autism, in a way, and he now is doing fine, and he, um, well, he he's been staying at this. He's been in the same job now for ten years, but I had to have a. I think I don't know if it was a psychologist or psychiatrist at the state, but they're like he can't, you know, function. 
and he is he's uh, he's got the IQ, he got low IQ too. You know what I'm saying? Is he getting some form of cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, or is this uh, is his cognitive functioning not sufficient for that? His cognitive functioning is not sufficient. He can drive, okay, mm -hmm. but he, you know, because I got involved because he got kicked out of his apartment. You know, I'm just going off on this tangent here because his parents didn't want it. They thought him being on his own would be okay. But then when I got, I knew something wasn't right. You know, just as a, I don't know, just something wasn't right. And sure. that, in that age group, you, you, you want people to, to do well and, and suffer a little bit, but what he was, he's the kind of person that would be homeless if we weren't. Right. Involved. There's a danger, in, there's a danger in both directions. You don't, you don't want to overdiagnose, but you don't want to ignore a, a genuine cognitive dysfunction and, you know, allow someone just to, to suffer needlessly. It's, Correct. It's, it's a delicate balance. So which is what is turn out what's good. He's honest, he's taking care of himself, but now he can't get fired because the state got involved. You know what I'm saying? And they goodwill got involved. And people badmouth good goodwill a lot too, but they helped him get some training to get a job. And he's been there for 10 years, which is amazing. Good. And, uh, so see, progress can't be made no matter what your challenge is. Correct. Right. And that's what it is. Yeah. And and thankfully he listens to me. I mean, you know, um, he listened to my advice and I was telling him, well, if you can just interview this person, they'll help you get a job. And I didn't tell him it was, you know, what it was, but, uh, but he, he's very, very happy and it's all good. And, and he, he's an example of, you know, resilience and we just be there and support him and not make him feel bad about certain things. And well, if, if someone with uh, autism or a condition similar to autism can exhibit resilience and can benefit from doing so, well, then surely the rest of us have no excuse, right? Exactly. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, you got to have some empathy. Uh, I don't know where I get it from, but maybe just like I said, because of the some of the being involved with uh, mil military brat, that's hard on a military family. I mean, you said you're going to go in the, in the military. Are you from a military family or? Uh, no, my dad was in the Air Force for two years, but uh, that was either before I was born or when I was very young. So we don't have a real, um, no, no particular military tradition in my family. I just thought that it would have been, um, I thought I would have been well suited for it. But in retrospect, uh, I don't know that I was right about that. You know, when you're 17, you think you're suited for a lot of things. Correct. <laughs> it, it Right. It's just my thing. My father was a went to the um was in the korean war and then went to france met my mother brought her back and that's kind of right here to the u.s excuse me and then he went to vietnam and that messed up a lot of people and i think that's what caused their divorce um sure. there's just a lot of different i'm just trying to be empathetic and and not judge people i think that's important and i think it's stoicism good. helps with that i think uh, it, it does that, that is sort of one of my challenges i, I do have a kind of a natural tendency towards uh, misanthropy. I'm uh, I'm not a I'm not a great natural fan of of humans. <laughs> I love dogs. How's that? <laughs> I, I do. I love dogs. Uh, I can tolerate cats. People. The problem the thing with people is they they talk. <laughs> right. <laughs> My husband said that about me. He said, "Bridget, you like dogs better than humans." I'm like, "And your what's your point?" You know. Yeah, he doesn't right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, dogs. Will, dogs love you no matter what. <laughs> they're they're definitely in the moment. And I, um, one thing I wanted to ask you was because this podcast is about resilience. How do you think stoicism is connected to that? And you know, what is your philosophy on that? Right. Well, you know, I mentioned one of the, the cardinal virtues is temperance or self discipline. And self-discipline is largely about developing a resilient character and resilient psychological and emotional states to deal with the challenges with which we're faced on a daily basis. I mean, everything from minor frustrations like a traffic jam all the way up to, um, you know, a, a death in the family that, that happens unexpectedly and everything in between. Um, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're about to have an election in two weeks. I, I suspect you're going to see a lot of very, very unstoic responses uh, from one side or the other when this uh, when this election is finally tallied up. And I would also suggest that we'd be better off uh, to be more um, rational and to be more self-controlled and self-disciplined 
whatever happens in the election and not go hurling bricks through windows and burning buildings down and, you know, uh, eviscerating each other online and all that kind of stuff. Um, even though, you know, I, I sometimes uh, have those kinds of impulses, I, I control them much better now than I did before I discovered stoicism. That's good. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, you, you did it because it is about, I think it is about controlling your, how you react, you just got to pause too sometimes. And I've learned that um, I don't drink caffeine. You know, it's good for me to not <laughs> because it gets me jacked up. And I yeah. think <laughs> everybody's different. Sure. But I've learned if you can tell if I've had some caffeine, you know, I'll go. Um, yeah, I just, I'm just naturally, I think I mentioned I'm naturally hyper. And so <laughs> I don't need it. And yeah. I remember, or I've had it some like coffee in the past. Oh, I'm a runner, right? I'll go run and push myself too hard. And that's kind of why I think things like that aren't good. I mean, for me anyway. For, for me, it's sleep. If I don't get a decent night's sleep, uh, I can be pretty crotchety. I can be pretty irritable. And I have to remind myself on, on those kinds of days, like before I head into my classroom, if I know I haven't slept well, I'll, I'll think before, as I'm heading through the door, don't don't lose it on these kids today. <laughs> don't, don't let them get to you. Don't let them irritate you. Don't, don't, you know, raise your voice or anything. And for the most part, I'm able to, uh, to avoid that for the most part. <laughs> I've had a few moments in the classroom. I'm sure it's um, right. Sleep is so critical too. I think just, um, just getting, I don't know how many hours you need. I need a minimum of seven to eight for me to function. <laughs> about the same, about the same for me. If I don't get right. seven, uh, and if I've had caffeine, I get affected, right? And that's when I was learned, okay, Bridget, don't do it. And I do um, exercise a lot. I think that helps me um, focus and be self-control. I, I, I like to still move a lot and run. I don't run every day anymore because I'm in my mid-50s. I'm a couple of years older than you. But yeah, I, I know how you're feeling. I, I work out a lot. Um, I used to be a, a wrestler and a football player and a boxer. And so uh, I, I like to keep in shape, but uh, you know, it gets harder as you get older. And uh, I can't help but notice there's a bit more of me these days than there used to be. <laughs> uh, that, that happens, I suppose, or I, I, I allowed it to happen, you know. It, it's definitely something that people, I think, is part of the stoicism is taking care of yourself. And, he, and sure. because and not a lot of women and mothers, by the way, or people who are caretakers or is that the right word? They're taking care of everybody else instead of themselves. You know, I see that a lot as um, sure. I was guilty of that um, because I had young, young boys and I traveled a lot for work. And you probably don't know this, but I've had cancer a couple of times. Oh, and man. that was a blast. But um, <laughs> But I hope you're cancer free at the moment. Um, yeah, I am now. It's been six years for the, from the last one. But again, it's all um, part of it was, you know, just pushing myself, you know, in a, in a corporate environment. And I had kids to take care of. And I'm so thankful my husband um, you, supported You're saying you think we can, we can do your immune system and it made you more susceptible? Yeah. In a way, yeah. I wasn't probably sleeping properly, you know, and you're eating um on the go too much yeah. and they also believe um i was because of the military i was exposed to something and around those military bases oh i see yeah and um so well, that's, I mean, you, you certainly are exhibiting resilience by uh, overcoming that and and moving right. forward in your career and with your attempts to help other people i think it's very admirable and that's what i want to do but i want people to understand that to appreciate every minute <laughs> you know what you have and we don't know how many we have do we no and that's kind of what you're saying and these unexpected deaths and you know one of my neighbors her son died uh, last week he well he's he's my age you know what i'm saying mid-50s but that was unexpected uh, that's that's young um uh, one of my best friends died pretty much out of nowhere from cancer uh he told me he had it and three weeks later he was dead he was in his 50s oh wow uh, he must have been very you know yeah it was very advanced it was stage yeah. four by the time he knew about it um i lost a brother to suicide unfortunately oh, he was wow. only 48 i believe wow uh, at the time. i lost a dad and my, my dad to uh, lung cancer so the, the I, I always tell people i don't 
I mean, this will sound morbid or, or maudlin, but uh, the world is going to kill you. Uh, it's going to kill all of us sooner or later. So um, make what you can of your life. Right. And enjoy it. Enjoy <laughs> I mean, it. I, I mean, as I'm not possible. right as much as possible. Right. I'm not trying to say that, oh, it's all rosy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But no. do stuff that like I'm so love to be outside in nature and I walk. I live, you know, near the lake in the woods. And so that's one of the reasons why we made our lifestyle that way. We bought a home here almost 20 years ago. Right. That because that we knew that was important to both my husband and I. So that I think it's your decisions are important. Try to try to look ahead a little bit too. You know, that's kind of <laughs> sure. And and you have to know yourself. You have to know your own proclivities. Some people uh you know really love living in the city. For me, it would drive me insane, I think. Yes. Um, and I, I, always, I, I always, you know, I have a few phrases I, I like to use. I always say, life's going to beat the crap out of you and kill you, but you're lucky to have it anyway. Right? Yes. It, we, we're, none of us were entitled to be born. None of us were entitled to be here. We're not entitled. I'm not entitled to, to my next, uh, you know, inhaled breath. Uh, I'm, I'm here for as long as either God or the forces of nature allow me to be. So. Let's let's see what we can make of it in the time we've got, and just remember it's you don't know how much time we've got. It's absolutely true, and just do the best with what we have. And I try to help others where I can, and a lot of it is just being try to keep things simple too. I think is important to me. Um, it's uh, uh, there's actually a chapter in the, the book you mentioned, "A Life Worth Living," entitled "Stoic Simplicity." Yes, it it just makes it makes you feel less overwhelmed. Um, it does for me. Yes, uh, exactly. There, there are people who thrive on on chaos and thrive on having you know a million things to do. I, I'm not one of those people. Um, right, and that's I think I, I liked it at the time when I was raising kids and running around like man, like a maniac. And I'm like, whoa, this is increased your think about your stress levels internally. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, it takes a toll. Yes, it takes its toll. The I, I think they call it the cortisol levels. I think that's what they they said. So. And then at the same time, I also went and did um, to help me heal. In between the two cancers, I did like health coach certification to understand to make sure I'm understanding things. Um, I, I believe in uh, is it functional medicine. Is that what you call it? A little bit of both. Yeah. yeah I've heard those terms. Um, I, I, I think it's an admirable thing you've done. You know, a lot of, right. a lot of people might have given up. A lot of people might have just. Right. And I'm like, well, my, my thing was when it came back again a second time. I'm like, I want to see my son graduate high school. You know, right. he was like, a, that was my goal. And then now, now he's 22, right? So, so it's, and it's all good. Uh, it's just are, kind are of. You, are, are your new goals like, you know, waiting, waiting to go to the wedding or hoping to go? Maybe, to the yeah. Uh, when I'm finished college, don't no, <laughs> I'm no find a, and, and that's another thing. People trying to find their, their path and, you know, you read so many, I, I don't watch the news. Right, because I think you pick up on those. Uh, it's all really opinion. I do try to read different things, but I've all I have read that a lot of people are in a lot of debt now from college, yeah. and you know, are they doing things that they don't really want to, or they're just told to do? And I think that's an issue with our this younger generation. Yeah, I agree. And right, what do you want to do? And uh, my son is doing. He's really always into tech, so he's now doing like learning full stack development. So he's always one of those, um, when he was little, he took everything apart, good and bad. Sometimes you couldn't put him back together. I, I got a brother like that. My brother, Nick is an engineer. He works for Boeing. And when we were little kids, none of the doorknobs in the house ever worked. <laughs> <laughs> he was always disassembling them and putting them back right. together. But I think that's good, right? But oh, yeah. at, the, at the time, I'm like, oh, you're breaking stuff. But then I'm like, okay, no, this is his how his brain is trying to learn things. Right. That, that's, that's, uh, he, my, my brother has the math and science brain, and I, I do not. <laughs> <laughs> right. If, if, right. My husband is so, he figures everything out, you know. Um, he's one of those where he, he's an IT guy, and um, he's very patient. And he jokes that I'm his worst customer. <laughs> um, when it comes to tech i'm not very patient you know what i'm saying and uh, just, well it's it's difficult i, uh, it I i'm not very well well schooled uh, when it comes I, I, i'm not a 
I'm not up on the the newest items in tech. I've only recently learned how to use Zoom. So <laughs> right in. And so a lot of times I've asked my husband or my younger son, okay, how, I might have a glitch or problem with the tech thing and they'll figure it out. Poof, no problem. I mean, yeah. you could Google, Google it, but um, I want to, I try to learn watching them do it. I'm one of those, um, try to, I have to see it, you know, <laughs> and touch it. And that's kind of how I learn. Uh, yeah, I, I try, I've, uh, one of our, one of my stepsons, my, my wife had uh, three kids. When I married her, she still has the three kids. <laughs> right, that's good. <laughs> My stepkids now, and uh, one of them is pretty good at that kind of thing. And I, I try to learn from watching him, but uh, uh, I don't want to disappoint your viewers. But as it turns out, I, I'm not particularly bright. <laughs> <laughs> but you got a lot of uh, a lot of patience, and, and your stoicism is helpful, right? I'm sure. Uh, that usually. <laughs> yeah, right. It's it's funny, but right, you're being, and that's what it is. That's why I and I called my podcast "Real Things Living." from my it's an offshoot of my first book called real things after that last cancer because i help people with their publications and things like that and, and then i'm like i'm always helping everybody i'm going to write my own book and that's kind of what happened that's how i did it and i put it out there and then i was getting interviewed for my other book and i'm like i like this podcasting stuff and i'm learning from so many other just connecting like this right. and i'm taking advantage of zoom during when COVID started, you know? Yeah, think about all these opportunities we have that we literally could never have anticipated. When you and I were kids, there was no such thing as the internet. No. There was no such thing as podcasts or, you know, Zoom. Um, I actually, I had a student, it's interesting, I had a student ask me some years ago uh, about, you know, when you, when you call someone on the phone, why is it called dialing? I said, there used to be a literal dial. <laughs> yes, a little spin thing. But you think about it, these, these kids have never seen that. So the word dial, <laughs> makes no sense to them right and I have like a sort of it looks like an old school phone in my kitchen just to be funny it's like it's it's it looks like it's a dial but it's, it's the numbers you push but it's a, in a circle and my yeah. kids are like when I first put it up they're like what is this I'm like that's the kind of phone I had growing up <laughs> the phone used to be a piece of furniture you didn't carry it in your pocket right it, so. And, now, and I remember and then, it was in our kitchen. If anyone called, I had to sit on the stairs on the other side of the, if I wanted to be in private on the other side of the kitchen to talk to somebody. But we only had one phone in my house. I don't, um, same thing and for us. And a long cord. So you can go to the other room with it and stretch the heck out of it. Um, right, right. <laughs> and it would, it would get all, it would get all curled up. You'd have to let it dangle. And now here we are, we're, we're writing books using technology that did not exist. <laughs> right. <laughs> When we were young, it's a, right. It's a, it's it's just amazing that, but I I'm trying to I also think this technology is good and trying to use it in a good way. There's good and you know like you mentioned the Zoom bombing and, but right. like Zoom did the right thing and they had to tweak it because they weren't expecting it either, and so they had to well, adjust and. Technology is always a double-edged sword. Yes, uh, it is. For all the advances, we we all know the the devastating consequences it can also have. This is you know. This is why we need to develop wisdom, not only as individuals, but as a, as a culture to, um, you know, harness the value of technology without letting it become our master, without letting it cause, uh, well, the kinds of devastation it can cause. Right. Um, and, and I've certainly, I don't know about you, um, kids are really into social media and all that stuff. But I think they're, they're I got, I don't like, I, I'm just kind of burned out on it a little bit. And um, mm -hmm. because it does take your attention away from what's in front of you, um, that's yeah, the bad I, side of social media, I think. That's just me. <laughs> well, there's also a lot of stuff out there that you probably don't want your kids to no. see, especially when they're young. And, um, you know, uh, we, we can have this conversation through uh, technology, but ISIS can also recruit, you know, the, the next generation of terrorists through this kind of thing. It, it, right. it cuts both ways. It's, it goes both ways. And we just have to set a good example and try to, to do that. And um, no, you have another a most recent book. What is your most recent book real quickly? The most oh. recent one just came out. It's called God Bless the Broken Bones. It's all about resilience, really. It's a, I anyone, love it. Yeah, anyone can be grateful for the good times, but can you be grateful even for the broken bones and the, and the tough stuff? And then this one about Epictetus' Enchiridion is coming out next year. Okay. This, this is a commentary on the handbook of Epictetus, which is okay. kind of one of the main stoic 
texts. Slave and sage for those who are just listening, right? Yes, he was both. I would I would argue. That that's good. So, what is the best place people want to learn more about you to to find more on you? Is there a website or or? Well, yeah, anybody who wants to learn more about me should probably seek counseling. I, I'm not worried. <laughs> I'm not an interesting person, but if you want to buy my books, uh, you know, Amazon's taken over the world. Go to go to Amazon and type in my name. It's a, it's a weird looking name, but you can see it there. Uh, you can also go to the John Hunt Publishing website. That's where I publish my books through there. John Hunt? Okay. Uh, John Hunt Publishing, yeah. And Five what I'll do, I'll have a, a link. You know, I'll have a summary of everything and I'll have a link for everybody to all Amazon and to John Hunt Publishing. Sounds good. And, and I uh, thought this is really great. And I really appreciate your time, Bill. Well, I appreciate you giving me the opportunity. <laughs> Thanks a lot. It was, it was really nice meeting you. Uh, yes, fun. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye.